Good evening. Yeah. Part-time Great Lakes sailor who likes to talk about ships that don't float. <laughs> Because I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, but yeah, so I call this show the Doomed Sisters, and it is actually two stories in one. Uh, the Western Reserve and the WH Gilcher are actually sister ships. And I knew obviously uh, about their, their individual stories, but when I started putting this particular show together in my research, I didn't realize just how parallel the two stories really were. And it's a little eerie if you let your imagination get away with you. Mine never does when I'm down in my boat nerd office ever. But uh, so Doom Sisters. This story starts all the way back in 1890. On August 20th, the Western Reserve is going to be launched uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And at the time, it's going to be the largest steel steamer built at that shipyard. Um, this 1890 Great Lakes shipping is really making the change from wooden vessels to steel vessels. So you have a wide variety of different types of ships on the Great Lakes, um, but steel is starting to replace wood as the main shipbuilding material. And so there's a, a big, big crowd to watch the launch of the Western Reserve. And then just a few months later, on December 18th, her twin sister, the W.H. Gilcher, is going to be launched at the same shipyard. So they're launched the same year at the same shipyard, and they are, a, at least to the eyes, they are identical. Uh, the Gilcher has a slightly different engine in it that uh, is a little less powerful than the Reserve. But to look at these two ships, the only difference you would notice would be the paint job. Other than that, they're identical. Starting with the Western Reserve, it's launched for this guy, Captain Peter Minch. And he is, the, uh, he is right in the top echelon of ship owners in 1890. His father, Philip Minch, uh, had been one of the biggest fleet owners of his day, and Peter starts out as a cabin boy on schooners. He's, he ships out at the very bottom of, of um, the ladder chain of command, if you will, for sailors. He works his way up all the way through with his father's fleet, works his way up to become a captain until he gets to be 55 years old and he comes ashore to manage his own fleet. And if you think about that, by 55, to go from cabin boy to major fleet owner is pretty successful. And because of his experience, he's actually one of the most respected ship owners on the Great Lakes. Um, there's not much about the Great Lakes shipping industry that Peter Minch does not know and understand very well on a first-hand basis. And he's the one who's going to order the Western Reserve to be built for his fleet. And that is really his flagship. So he spares no expense in building this new steel steamer. It does not take long for the Western Reserve to start breaking records. She's going to carry 96, just over 96,000 bushels of wheat from Duluth. And that's going to be the largest grain cargo uh, hauled up to that time. And not only is she breaking tonnage records, she's also setting speed records. She goes from detour to Port Huron in 17 hours and from Detroit to Buffalo in 20 hours. And you always have to appreciate turn of the century news reporting because you'll notice in 1890 when a lot of people were still using horses to get around, they describe a massive steel freighter as a trotter. I think it was doing a little bit more than trotting out there on the water, but um, so she's, she's really turning heads. She's proving to be exactly what she was billed to be. Fast forward a couple of years to 1892 on August 28th, the Western reserve is in Cleveland, Ohio, and she's bound upbound for two harbors, Minnesota on Lake Superior to go get a load of ore. Now this, is not just a normal everyday trip for her. On board is going to be the owner, Captain Minch, along with his wife, his 10-year-old son, Charlie, and his seven-year-old daughter, Florence. 
his oldest son, Philip, and his oldest daughter are going to stay at home. And Captain Minch is going to use this particular trip as a summer cruise for his family. He's going to take him up north, let him let him get away from Cleveland, especially in 1892 before air conditioning. If uh, you were fortunate enough to own a Great Lakes vessel, it was not uncommon for these people to take their families on on a trip up north to escape all the heat. Because uh, even in August on Lake Superior, it's a lot cooler than in Cleveland. So the owner himself and his family, he also takes his sister-in-law and his niece along. And they're going to depart Cleveland. And they have nice weather all the way up Lake Huron until they get to the Sioux Locks on August 30th at 6 o'clock at night. All the way up the lake, they have smooth sailing, nice weather. And they go up the St. Mary's River. Captain Minch brings, uh, brings his kids up to the pilot house to go you know, to watch the scenery go by. I should make a note, though, that even though I call him Captain Minch because he was a licensed captain, he's not navigating the vessel. Captain Myers is actually the one in command of the vessel. Captain Minch is simply the owner and is along for the ride. So they get to the Sioux Locks at 6 o'clock at night on August 30th. After they lock through is when the weather changes. Once they get about here, they're off Point Iroquois Lighthouse, the weather turns, and the Western Reserve finds itself going nose first into a heavy late summer gale. And they're going to pound their way up to Whitefish Point, undoubtedly thinking when you're on one of the biggest and newest steel steamers, you can probably muscle your way through any storm that can be thrown at you. When they get to Whitefish Point, they're going to haul around to the northwest, heading again for Two Harbors, Minnesota, along the North Shore. Somewhere about 60 miles northwest of Whitefish Point. Not at 9 a.m. like this news article says. News reporting has, uh, wasn't any better back in 1892 than it can be today. They got the time wrong because there is no way that someone locks through the Sioux Locks at 6 o'clock at night and they are only 60 miles from Whitefish Point at 9 o'clock the next morning. That's just incorrect. But about 60 miles off of Whitefish Point, the wheelsman, one of the guys that steers the boat, Harry Stewart, is woken up by a large crash and he goes running out on deck. And just like the story I told you last, last month about the Bradley, he finds the Western Reserve breaking in two. Not a comfortable moment for a sailor. You're in a storm on Lake Superior and the big boat you're on is breaking in half. And then everything gets chaotic at that point. But even in the middle of the chaos, there's one particular moment that stuck in Harry Stewart's mind. And that was little seven-year-old Florence out on deck of a sinking ship. And she's, she's begging her dad, Captain Minch, to get them in a lifeboat to get off this thing. And she is just absolutely terrified of everything that's going on around her. And Stewart says that Captain Minch was already you know, hustling his family back to the stern, back to the lifeboats were kept. And everyone's trying to get off the Western Reserve because there is no doubt, no doubt at all, that she's doomed. There's no way that they can save the ship. The, the crew do manage to get both lifeboats in the water, which is no small feat in, in a storm. Lifeboats, we all like to think of lifeboats as a real comforting, life-saving piece of equipment. In a storm, traditional lifeboats are pretty much useless. They really are. But the crew managed to get them both lowered. Um, and Harry Stewart says it was not without difficulty. He claims that this was the first time that these lifeboats had ever been lowered on the Western Reserve. I'm not too sure about that. I was not able to find just how long Harry Stewart had been aboard the Western Reserve. But I find it hard to believe that a new vessel would go two years without having a single lifeboat drill. Um, but... Regardless, they could still have been having problems, either from the conditions or just lack of training if they had new crewmen on board who didn't know exactly what was required of them. So both lifeboats get in the water. One is metal, one is wood. And Harry Stewart and 16 other crewmen 
along with Captain Minch's family, get in the wooden lifeboat. The rest of the crew abandon ship in the metal lifeboat. It does not take them long to get off the Western Reserve. They realize they don't have a lot of time. One poor guy, Carl Myers, another wheelsman, he's the son of Captain Myers, who's actually in command of the Western Reserve. He couldn't get to any lifeboat. He was stuck on the bow and he had to jump overboard. He couldn't even get to a lifeboat. So he had to jump into the 15, 20 foot waves. Um, and another guy, well, actually before that, the people in the wooden lifeboat, Harry Stewart included, they watched the Western Reserve sink in about 10 minutes, he estimated. Give or take a few in either direction. I'm sure when he ran out on deck and saw what was going on, the first thing he did was not look at his watch. But he, uh, he estimates the reserve sank in about 10 minutes. The engine was still going at full speed ahead. So the propeller was still churning at full RPMs. And when the ship actually sank, they said there was an explosion under the water as the cold water hit the hot boilers. So everyone's in the water. The Western Reserve is gone. And the people in the wooden lifeboat pull Carl Myers out of the water. They find him in the waves and pull him on board. And then they find another person from the metal lifeboat. And they pull him on board. And he tells them that the metal lifeboat had actually capsized. And the other people in that boat were, were never seen alive again. So now there's 19 people in a wooden rowboat in Lake Superior in a storm. Not a comfortable place to be. But not long after that, they get some hope. They see the lights of another ship coming right at them. They see hope. And they're waving and they're yelling and they're trying to get this passing ship's attention. They even try to ignite. The ladies on board had, had shawls on and they tried, to, they tried to ignite the shawls to use them as makeshift torches. Everything was a little too wet to burn at that point, so they didn't. And all they can do is watch this ship sail past them. Remember, it's nighttime. It's dark. There's 20-foot seas. There is no way the people on this passing ship can see a lifeboat out, out in the darkness. Um, Harry Stewart thought he knew what ship it was. Um, he thought it was the Neoso. I don't think he was quite right. I believe it was probably this boat, the Italia. Because later on, her captain, after the storm, says he saw the Western Reserve. And the ironic part is he saw her lights go out. He was actually watching the Western Reserve when the lights blinked out for the last time. But in the storm, he said, the lights on my boat, we were struggling to keep them, keep them lit. So he just assumed that the Western Reserve had suffered the same problems his boat was having. It never occurred to him that this large, brand new steel steamer had gone down. And so these people in the lifeboat watch the Italia sail right by. They're not seen. And they know they're in for a long night in a, in a rowboat trying to get to shore somewhere. It's not an easy time in, to be in a lifeboat. There we go. They're having to bail the water out constantly with their hands, their hats. Uh, there was one bucket in the lifeboat. And whatever they had, they were constantly bailing water out of the boat to keep it afloat. And Harry Stewart mentions watching Mrs. Minch hanging on to her two kids with everything she's got. And then at one point, Captain Minch yells out that, he'd, that one of his children had gone overboard. He watched it. He watches one of his children get washed out into Lake Superior. Carl Meyer, the Captain Meyer's son, the wheelsman who had to jump overboard off the bow, he actually looks at Harry and says, do you think we can make it to shore? Do we have a chance? And Harry Stewart, in typical laconic sailor fashion, says, well, we'll try. He really can't promise anybody anything. But he says, we're going to try. I going to try to get to shore. And they actually make a good evening of it. They're still floating. They're still working on getting to shore. They're as they get closer to shore, it's looking promising. That little wooden boat is still in one piece somehow. 
But when you get closer to shore, those big waves start breaking. That last half mile to a mile to shore is the most dangerous time for shipwrecked sailors. You get in that surf and lifeboats will just get beaten to pieces. And remember, this is a heavily overloaded lifeboat. There's 19 people in this boat. It was simply too heavy. They got about a mile from shore and that little lifeboat is capsized and everyone is thrown into the water. And Harry Stewart says at that point, he lost sight of everybody else. He couldn't see them, but he could hear them and he could hear them calling for help. And one by one, the voices went away until he couldn't hear anybody. So all he can do is swim for shore or the direction that he's pretty sure shore is. Harry Stewart is going to be the only person from the Western Reserve to make land alive. And barely alive at that. He even says that he doesn't remember how he got to shore. He remembers the, the boat capsizing. He remembers just trying to swim in a particular direction. Uh, but the actual getting to the beach and getting, getting on shore is kind, kind of lost to his memory. He does know that when he got there, he was so exhausted, he couldn't even stand up. He just laid there for a while and rested because he was so exhausted, he could not even stand up. Now, this is not just coming ashore on a nice sandy beach and life is good. This is Lake Superior. Those beaches up there are in the middle of nowhere and they're rocky. And a law in 1892, that Northern shore of the Upper Peninsula is not exactly habitated much. Harry Stewart is not done with his ordeal. He's just survived a shipwreck. He survived almost all night in a storm in a rowboat. And now he has to walk 12 miles for help. It's 12 miles to the nearest life-saving station. This is before the U.S. Coast Guard. So this is still the old U.S. Life-Saving Service. And so there were stations along the Great Lakes and other places along the oceans, too, um, where help could be found. But it's 12 miles away. The nearest life-saving station for Harry is going to be at Muscalunge Lake, more commonly called Deer Park. You may, may be more familiar with that name, but in 1892, it was Muscalunge Lake. He walks 12 miles to the life-saving station, frozen, exhausted, hungry, and the only survivor of his ship. When he gets to the life-saving station, the lifesavers do what they do best. They immediately grab their gear and go looking for, for anyone else. Uh, they do telegraph. There's another life-saving station at Grand Marais. And so Harry Stewart kind of came ashore right in the middle of them, right in between those two. And so both stations respond. Both stations send help out and go looking. Philip Minch, Peter Minch's son back in Cleveland, initially did not believe the story. Again, news didn't travel all that fast or even all that accurately in 1892. And it was so unbelievable that the reserve could have been lost. Remember, most ships at this point are not as big, older construction, wooden, sail-powered. The idea that the reserve could have been lost was just unbelievable. Until Harry Stewart is taken back to Sault Ste. Marie, and he telegraphs Philip and says, yes, it did, in fact, go down. And poor Philip is left with the fact that he's just lost most of his immediate family. Philip was uh, in his early 20s, and he's just lost his dad, his mom, and two siblings. All that's left are him and his sister. And not only that, he works for his dad's shipping company. So it is going to be his responsibility to deal with the aftermath. Not only did he lose his family, he has to deal with the recovery of their bodies and he has to deal with the recovery of the crew and the questions about how the ship was lost. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the question was, was there life preservers on the, on the reserve? There should have been, but in, an, in a case like that, how many were able to, uh, to even get them on? Um, there were, there were a couple in the lifeboat. I knew on that, but also 1892 life jackets were not exactly designed to be in the water for a long period of time. After a couple hours, they would actually start soaking in the water and lose their buoyancy. Life preservers are really for just a short amount of time to keep people afloat. And then also, yes, it's August, but Lake Superior is cold. And people will still succumb to hypothermia. So some people did have the life jackets. I don't think all of them probably did. And then also in that heavy surf, when that boat overturned, a lot of them were just pulled back out to sea. Yep. So then the search begins. And Captain Fromm of the Deer Park or Muscalunge Lake Life Saving Station, he finds Captain Minch and uh, his sister in law. It says here, uh, uh, Peter Minch and a lady were recovered. That lady is actually turns out to be his sister in law. Later on, Carl Myers is found, the one that asked. Harry Stewart, if he thought they could make it to shore, his body is found. The undertaker from Sault Ste. Marie actually goes up to the life-saving station at Muscalunge Lake and takes possession of the bodies and prepares them to be sent back to Cleveland for burial. And they're going to load these, these lost people on downbound freighters, and they're going to take them home, which if, for someone like Peter Minch is rather fitting. He made it. He made his living on the Great Lakes, so to be taken home for burial on a freighter was probably only the fitting way to go. There's a really cool story, if there can be a cool story about this many people being lost. But the U.S. Life Saving Service were some pretty neat guys. And Captain Fromm from Deer Park, he's the one that finds Captain Peter Minch. And when he finds him in the captain's pocket, is $700 in cash. That's a lot of money now, but in 1892, that's even more. You're, on, you're out there, north shore of the Upper Peninsula in the middle of nowhere. It would have been very easy to just pocket that money. Nobody would have known. But Captain Fromm turns it over to Philip Minch. He gives the money over, over to his son who immediately offers a reward. He offers him part of that money back as a thank you. Captain Fromm tells Philip, I'm just doing my job. He would not take a reward for returning the money. Uh, Philip Minch is not going to let this go unnoticed. So he actually writes this, uh, this letter here to Captain Fromm's superior, Jerome Kaya and tells him what Captain Fromm did and says, be sure that he gets a commendation. He wouldn't take a reward from me, but please make sure that your, your service recognizes what he did. So in the middle of all that, you have one, one life-saving service captain who was just doing his job. In September, September 10th, there's going to be the burials in Cleveland, and all the ships in Cleveland Harbor are going to fly their flags at half-mast. To give you an idea of just how respected Captain Minch was, this is a four-person funeral. It's going to be held at the Minch home. And long before the funeral is supposed to start, the house is packed. People are lined up out the door, down the sidewalk. They're standing in the yard. Hundreds, if not over a thousand people, show up to pay their respects. And the people who attend the funeral is the who's who of Great Lakes shipping. Owners from all sorts of companies show up to attend the funeral. One thing was recovered from the Western Reserve, and that was her starboard running light. Ships have a green and a red running light on either side of the ship. Um, 
if the red goes on the port side, the green goes on the starboard side, and that allows other vessels to know which direction a ship is going in the dark. And the starboard running light was recovered. It's a, you can see it here. It is an enclosed lantern. So it had buoyancy when it broke away from the ship, it floated. And that was returned to Philip. That was given to him. And he actually put it on his front porch and he wired it so it would light up. And he kept it lit for the rest of his life in memory of his family. Um, it's now on display at the National Great Lakes Museum in Toledo. Uh, that's where I saw it. That's where I took this picture of it. But Philip had this one piece of the vessel that took his family and he had it shining on his front porch for the rest of his life. The Western Reserve has still to be found. We don't know where the wreck is. We've never seen it. We have to take Harry Stewart's word at it that it broke in half. Certainly other stories bear out the fact that other vessels have broken in half on the Great Lakes. But I can't add to the story from there because we haven't seen the wreck. We have no more evidence. We just have the testimony of one survivor. But then there's that other boat, the W.H. Gilcher. I told you the lives of these two boats are scarily parallel. When I go through the story of the Gilcher, if I sound like I'm repeating myself, I'm not. I promise. I may, I may teach high school. I may be a little stressed out as we get close to Christmas break, but I'm not, I haven't lost that much of my critical thinking skills. I am not repeating myself. These two boats are almost interchangeable. They are physically identical to the eyes. And again, they're launched in the same year, December 18th, 1890. The Gilcher is launched for the Gilchrist fleet. And again, it is identical to the Western Reserve. It's launched at the exact same shipyard as the reserve. So they start their life in the same year, from this, built from the same plans, launched in the same place. The Gilcher gets shortchanged a little bit. It was the second one launched. So the Western Reserve got all the headlines for the rec broken records, and the Gilcher just comes along and does the same thing. But her sister had already set the records. So the Gilcher has a pretty, I don't want to say boring, but pretty, well, to her life, does, that doesn't make the headlines very much until 1892 in April when she runs aground in the uh, St. Clair River at Port Huron. And it takes several tugs, a couple hours to get her off the sandbar. She got herself stuck pretty hard. October 25th of 1892, the same year that the reserve went down, we're only a couple of months after the Western Reserve sank, the Gilcher Buffalo bound for Milwaukee with 3,080 tons of coal. And she's going to make her way up. Pretty decent sailing. She gets up in Northern Lake Huron. The seas become a bit choppy. On October 28th at 2.20 in the afternoon, she is sighted passing through the Straits of Mackinac. And as she sails west, the weather gets worse. And she's not seen again. The Gilcher will not make it to Milwaukee. When she's overdue at Milwaukee, by October 28th, the reporter is lost. There's a big storm going on in Northern Lake Michigan when a ship does not arrive on time or within a reasonable amount of time, it doesn't take people long to figure out what probably happened. And the Gilters reported as lost. That report is proven correct quickly after that when wreckage starts to be found on the islands of Northern Lake Michigan, on the Manitous and the Fox Islands. And that wreckage is marked W.H. Gilter. Some people think that the evidence from that wreckage shows that she broke in half just like her, her sister did. But she's clearly gone. But in the aftermath of that, turns out that sighting at the Straits was not the last time she was seen. Someone else saw her before she disappeared. The captain of a wooden schooner, the seaman, that boat right there, he spots the Gilcher. 
just off the Fox Islands. And it caught his attention because he is a sailing vessel. He's a schooner. And so the rules, the rules of the road at the time is a steam, steam powered vessel had to give way. They had to yield to a sailing vessel. They have more ability to maneuver than a vessel that's powered by wind. And the Giltzer didn't do it. He should have given way to the seaman and he didn't. So the captain of the schooner is now starting to watch the steamer and wondering what is up. And of course he knew right away who it was because there's only two boats that look like the Gilcher and he knew where the other one was. It was at the bottom of Lake Superior. So it could only be the Gilcher. He starts watching it and he noticed that it was keeping its bow into the waves, which was not the direction he was going. This was a Northwest gale. So it, it caught his attention that something wasn't right. And he came to the conclusion that probably Captain Weeks of the Gilcher at that point was trying to save his vessel. She had probably already began taking on water and he was trying to find a way to save his ship. And that's why he didn't yield to the sailing vessel like he should have. There's always that one story of someone who survives, survives a shipwreck. And Captain Weeks of the Gilcher, his son was supposed to be his second assistant engineer. And initially he was reported as lost with, with the ship. Turns out he was late to work. He missed the boat in Buffalo. And so he actually survived because he wasn't there. Again, wreckage starts being found from the Gilcher. It's definitive. The Gilcher is gone. Some of the evidence, though, on North Manitou Island right here, they find the strongbacks that hold the canvas covers on the lifeboats. Now, normally, when you're getting to ready to launch a lifeboat, you untie the ropes that hold these on and take them off, and you roll the canvas cover back, and you prepare the boat for launching. These ropes were, were chopped, chopped through with an ax. So whatever happened to the Gilcher, these guys did not have time to untie them like they should have. And these knots probably should have been, they, they would have been tied on with some kind of slip knot. You would have been able to grab the tail end of the rope and just pull and untie these things. Life-saving equipment covers are not tied on in a way that is difficult or time-consuming to get them off. They're designed to be untied quickly in the case of an emergency. And these guys had to cut through them with an ax. The, the mast on the Gilcher was found on Fox Island, which caused some people to question why. There was a mast, even though it was a steamer. In, 18, in the 1890s, steam vessels still had masts and emergency sails because people didn't quite trust steam technology yet. Those early steam engines still had a bad habit of failing. Um, but why the mast raised, raised questions was Harry Stewart on the reserve mentioned that when the reserve broke, her mast broke in half. Don't know why. But then they find the mast of the Gilcher and people start asking, did the Gilcher suffer the same fate as the reserve? There is some evidence that says perhaps. And then two bodies are found up here on the Fox Islands. That's it. Just two of the crew are ever found. So again, whatever happened to the Gilcher, it happened fast. They had to cut through ropes with axes and they weren't able to get off the ship in time. So what happened? Well, the insurance companies would sure like to know. Now in a couple of months, two almost brand new large steel steamers have been lost with only one survivor between the two of them. These companies that insure freighters are asking questions. They're not going to issue insurance policies on ships that aren't safe. 
They want to know what's going on. They call a meeting in Chicago and they start asking questions. They want to know what needs to change. They're going to start taking a look at the inspection and classification of these big new steel ships. What's going on? And then in a great, great uh, show of salesmanship, there seems to be some sort of competition between the insurance companies because back then, comp shipping companies would take insurance policies, multiple insurance policies out on each ship. So they wouldn't insure the ship for the whole value with one company. So you've got a couple different insurance companies they have to pay off on the Gilcher, and they're all, they all seem to be having this competition as to who can pay it off first. Who can pay the Gilchrist company their, their insurance policy the fastest? So what happened to the Gilcher? There's no one left to tell us. Well, some people realize immediately that she's the sister ship of the Western Reserve. Did she break in two like the Reserve did? There's some evidence from the wreckage, wreckage that suggests perhaps. Perhaps she did. Something else was found on those islands, though. And it wasn't just the wreckage of the Gilcher. There was also wreckage from a schooner named the Ostrich. And so some people think that maybe those two ships collided in the storm and they both sank. There is a reef by South Fox Island. And some people think that the Gilcher punctured a hole in her bottom on that reef and then took on water and sank. Three main theories as to what could have happened to the Gilcher. So what really happened to her? Believe it or not, the Gilcher's not done. There's a note in a bottle. Literally a note in a bottle. In early December, on North Manitou Island, a bottle was found with a note that says, whoever finds this bottle, please send it to number 440 Ohio Street, Buffalo. She broke in half, can't last much longer. The Gilcher is a goner. Goodbye, everybody, Tom Finley. Now there are many, many cases in Great Lakes history of fake notes and bottles. When a ship goes down, there are uh, some pretty ghoulish people out there that would write fake notes and throw the bottle in the water and let people find it. And it would make the headlines, it would make the news, and it would really confuse the investigation. Could this be another one case like that? Perhaps. I can tell you there was a Tom Finley on board the Gilcher. He was the second assistant engineer who was filling in for the captain's son who had missed the boat. There was a Tom Finley on board. But did he write this note? We don't know. And we still don't know what happened to the Gilcher because she hasn't been found either. I was really hoping that she would have been found by now. A little over a year ago, I talked to a gentleman who hunts for shipwrecks, and he told me that he had three large targets out in that part of Lake Michigan. He was hoping to go back and look. And I told him, if you find the Gilter, just tell me what condition she's in. Tell me if she's in two pieces or one. That's all I need. And he said he would. I saw him just a couple weeks ago, and he wasn't able to get out there. So she might be found soon. But as for now, that's all I can tell you tonight. Until so someone finds one of these two ships, and I can add on to this story, that's all I can tell you. Kind of a dramatic ending, kind of short, but someone's got to find the boat. <laughs> then I can tell you more. Are there any questions? I told you these two boat stories were a little scarily similar. What was the quality of the steel those days? The quality of the steel was definitely not as good as it is today. That still would have been steel that was made using what we called the Bessemer system or Bessemer process. Um, it would have been very similar to um, the type of steel that would have would have been used in building the Titanic that we know now 
uh, Bessemer process steel in cold temperatures gets brittle. And Lake Superior at all times and Lake Michigan in October is very cold. So there definitely is a high possibility of the steel causing, causing a problem. And because they both went down in storms, which is the most stressful time on a ship's hull. So the quality of the steel definitely is prob I would say probably a main player in the loss of both ships. The Western Reserve hasn't been found. Do we have any idea how far offshore she was when she put a gun down? Um, perhaps. Uh, Harry Stewart uh, suggested they were somewhere around uh, I think he said about 20 miles offshore, but here's the problem. Harry was asleep in his bunk when the thing broke in half. Yes, he was a wheelsman. Yes, when he was on watch, he would have known where they were, but he wasn't on watch when the boat went down. Does he know automatically where they are when he runs out of his cabin and sees the boat breaking in two? I would take that estimation with a grain of salt. Given the area, she's definitely in deep water. She's probably at least uh, probably three to 400 feet down. But as far as how far offshore, and I think that's part of the reason why she hasn't been found. Um, I think a lot of people have been looking round about where Harry said they should be, and they haven't found it. So that tells me he was probably off on his guess. Um, the thing about the Western Reserve that amazes me that she hasn't been found because that is the part of the lake there is a group, uh, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society, that's kind of their area. And they search that part of Lake Superior almost every summer. So if someone was going to find her, I would have thought they would have by now. So I think she's probably not where she's supposed to be. I think that's what's causing the delay. Anything else? When those guys um, that steward, how did they know which way to get to um, door? Um, if it was dark, when they keep holding, mm -hmm. they know how to get there. Yeah. And then once he got on door, how did he find his way to um, that station? Sure. So, um, you know, as far as how how they knew where to go to shore, because uh, it's a good point, right? It's dark out. You're in a storm, but Everyone on board a ship knows where, where they're going. And you know, um, if, you are, if you are upbound on Lake Superior, you know where the shore is, roughly. Um, obviously, you know, with the Keweenaw Peninsula and the shoreline is not a straight line, but everyone on board knows where you're going. You know, basically where land is. Um, and as far as how he knew where to find help, um, the Life Saving Service had stations all around the Great Lakes, and those guys knew where it was. Now, did he know exactly how far it was? No. But he knew that if he just started walking east, he would hit a Life Save. Now, he probably didn't know if it'd be Deer Park or Grand Marais, I'm guessing, but he would have known that if he just followed the shoreline east, he would have run into a Life Saving Station. So those guys... Those guys knew where all those stations were. Yep. 